In the 21st century, websites provide a great source of information, but there are some serious drawbacks to it. Of course, when we're talking about websites, websites can be updated very quickly so they can have the most most updated information. And this can really matter for some small things. But most of the time, you don't if you're doing a research paper, you're not really interested in something that was updated yesterday. You really just need the most valid information, which is why you go to journals or to ebooks. So they want to talk about how you look how you vet websites and decide is this website a good professional or scholarly source. Okay. Now first a clarification. When I'm talking about websites, I mean things which exist solely as web pages. So for example, if you want to consider the validity of an ebook, you need to consider that in the same way you would any book. Also, if you get onto an online database, you know, uh, you look on Google Scholar, you get into your university library databases and they show you journal articles. Those journal articles exist as journal articles, not really as separate websites. And you should treat them the way you would other journal articles, you know, assigning, uh, evaluating the validity in that way as well. Now I'm talking about things which exist solely as websites, which unfortunately, because it's so simple to get to, so many students will immediately then take those uh, and just say, well, I'll just search and I'll take a couple of those and I'll call that research. Well, that's not research because number one, they have great drawbacks. And number two, if a student's doing that, probably they don't know what's a good source and what isn't a good source. Okay. So what's wrong with just, you know, putting the subject into a search engine, hitting go and looking for some good looking sources there. Well, the problem with that is, is that most search engines operate off of the principle of finding things with the greatest relevancy to what you've looked for and the most hits. So that is the most people who go to that site. Well, that's great, right? The more people who go there, the more important it is, right? No. In fact, quite the opposite is true. You know, there's a game show called Family Feud. And the way Family Feud, the game show works is two teams of families compete and they ask them questions. And the question is, we interviewed, you know, a uh, hundred people uh, and asked them this question. And then they ask a question like, what is your favorite pizza topping or some question like this? And then the two families compete to see who can figure out what was said the most. In other words, to win family feud, it doesn't help to be smart. In fact, the more smart, the, the more imaginative and the smarter you are, the worse you'll do. The way to win family feud is to be as unimaginative and as boring and as average as you possibly can be. And even worse, because it's a family team setup, in order to win family feud, you have to be part of the most boring average family you can imagine. You don't want creative thinkers or deep thinkers in there. They will fail. So not only are you going to get the most average response, but who is the average person? The average person is not an expert, is not an expert. So let me give you an example of something which happens all the time uh, in my own classes. So I teach medieval literature. And so one of the things we talk about is medieval romance, medieval romance. It's a kind of genre of literature. And so every time I teach this, I'll get some sort of paper where someone will uh, write uh, about, uh, they'll have clearly Googled something and they'll find, they'll look at, you know, romance books and they'll start talking about romance books. 
The problem is that romance books, if they just do a search for it, they're going to find out it's about love. But that's not what we mean in medieval literature when we use the word romance. It's a genre that has nothing particular to do with love. Now, some medieval romances have love stories, but a lot don't. Love has nothing to do with medieval romances. The average person doesn't know that, but the expert in the field does know that. And if they're going to, to websites put up by experts in the field, then they would know that. Okay. So you're like, okay, so I can't just go by what is on the first few pages of hits because those are probably not going to be expert sites because if they were, most people wouldn't go to them, which is true. Like those first few pages can probably give you simple information that is easily verifiable. Like, you know, what year was Franz Kafka born? A question I put to you for a reason. So let me tell you a story about what happens when you think, okay, I'll just look for a very professional looking website. I'll look for a very scholarly looking website. Some years ago, I had a student write a paper and then the paper uh, talked about how uh, the philosopher Frederick Hegel was influenced by the author Franz Kafka. Well, there's a major problem with that. And the major problem is that Kafka was born about a half a century after Hegel died. So unless, unless one or both of them were time travelers, that's not possible. But the student had a very, had written a very conscientious paper and had a very good work cited page. So I thought, oh, this student misunderstood what they saw. And so I went to the web pages that they looked at to see like, what did they look at that they misunderstood? And of the things on their works cited page, they had a lot of things directly about Franz Kafka, a lot of things about Hegel, but only one website that was about both of them. And I went to that website and that website was like written by some crazy person who wrote it as if Kafka had influenced Hegel. And me looking at that thought, it looked very professional. It looked very scholarly. The problem is it was all just crazy talk. It wasn't true. So you can't just judge by what you see. You have to go a little deeper. Well, then sometimes students will say, okay, well, I'll go by the URL. This is a .edu site, or this is a .gov site, or this is a .com site. Well, that is not an appropriate way to look at this. Why? Well, let's take .edu. It's less common now, but sometimes web uh, uh, universities will allow and have allowed students to build web pages on their uh, on their platform. Um, I had one when I was a student. Uh, I had more than one actually, and so just because a, and just because a .edu website doesn't mean it's put up by an expert in the field. It wasn't that my university was asserting that everything on my website was true. It's just, they were providing this space so that I could learn how to put up a website. It was really what it was all about and to create websites that were of easy access to other people. And so I'd have a lot of students who will turn it, turn essays and they'll say, well, it's a .edu webpage. And I'll say, well, who wrote this? And they'll say, well, John Smith. And I'll say, who's John Smith? Well, I don't know. Is John Smith an expert? I don't know. And it turns out John Smith, if you dig deep enough, is a student. So they've just essentially done the family feud method. They asked the, uh, someone else who doesn't know any more than they do to be an expert for them, right? Well, what about .gov sites? Aha, now we have the weight of the government behind it, right? Well, maybe not. Because you have to remember on .gov sites, governments and politicians have political interests. So for another example, one time some years ago, I had a student and she wrote a, a paper and the facts in it were just wildly false, like crazy off the mark. Uh, they were, she had statistics that were wrong by not, not by scores of 10 to a hundred times off what it should have been. Well, I looked at what the student wrote and I thought, well, surely the student who was a good student and was trying to 
they did the research the best they could and they cited everything properly. Surely they made a mistake. So again, I went to the website and found that she'd gotten all of her most questionable statistics from one particular website. And it was the website of a congresswoman in the House of Representatives who posted these things on her website, no doubt because she thought they would be politically advantageous for her. Were the things true? No, they were crazy false, but it didn't matter. And so the student saw this and said, well, I mean, someone in the government said this is true, so it must be true. No. You have to remember that governments and government agencies and individual politicians have also political motives behind the things that they post. Again, is, does someone saying something politically motivated or personally motivated, does that mean it is necessarily false? No, it doesn't, but you need to really be able to corroborate it from somewhere else before you go saying that this thing is true. All right. Well, that's no good. Well, what about dot coms, right? I see dot coms all the time. That must be good. Well, again, dot coms, we're talking about commercial interests and commercial interests uh, are posting websites because of commercial reasons. Some are just platforms for crazy people, right? Uh, you know, my website, profawesome.com, we're not making any money. That's just what I'm using. Uh, but if I made money, what does that mean? Like, am I saying things on there in order to make money? Uh, if I were trying to make money off of that website, I definitely would only say things that were valuable. So, uh, for example, I own a small publishing company, witampublishing.com. Our website, everything on there is advantageous to us. We don't post uh, books that we started to edit and we just had so much trouble with the, uh, with the author that we refused to, to, to go forward with them anymore, right? Uh, you know, um, we don't really have bad reviews, but if we had bad reviews, we wouldn't post them on the website, right? Uh, you know, we, we have a commercial interest. And so if someone wants to use our website and cite it, they have to keep in mind every time, well, what is their interest? What is their, why are they saying this? Why are they posting this out in the public for us? Okay. So basically it sounds like you're saying everything you could possibly look at is bad. So don't use websites. Absolutely not. Websites can be valuable source of information. So what do you want to look for to know if a website is a valuable source of information? You want to look for one of two things either a person's name associated with what is written or a professional organization associated with what is written. So let's say, start with someone's name. If I see a website and it says it is written by um, Richard Scott Noakes, right? You find a website and I'm the one who wrote it. Is that, or maybe you're looking at this YouTube video right here and thinking like, I don't know, can I cite this? Well, my question is, what are my credentials? You should be able to look around and find out what my credentials are to say what I'm saying. So right now I'm talking a lot about how to do writing. Well, you look around and, and how to do research. You look around and you'll find, oh, he is a tenured professor at a university who uh, teaches writing all the time. So yeah, I'm a valid source for that. But could you go online and maybe find videos of me talking about other things I'm not an expert in? Sure. Um, I can't think of any at the top of my head, but I'm sure I have. Uh, sometimes I'll post things for fun. Um, and just because I am professor or doctor, this or that, or the other thing, it doesn't mean that I'm an expert in everything. I'm an expert in some things. So am I expert enough to talk about something? Now, what if you find something and you find the person and there's a name and you go looking for them and you can't find out, are they an expert in it or not? Well, the chances are then that they're not. So if you can't find anything about them, if you can't find out that there's someone who should be, who, who you should trust on this subject, then you just need to pass them up and go look for a different web page. The same is true for professional organizations. Professional organizations sometimes will have websites but individual members maybe don't sign the articles or web pages and that's fine. But then what is that professional organization? Just because it has an important sounding name doesn't mean that it is an important organization. In fact, 
my experience has generally been the reverse is that real, uh, the, the sort of oldest and most important professional organizations have kind of, um, very easy or basic sounding names. Whereas the more sort of, uh, global society of whatever, uh, those tend to be a little more, uh, upstarts or maybe even lots of nobodies because there's nothing to say you are an official or not an official organization. If today I wanted to start an organization, uh, you know, uh, called the international, uh, organization of, uh, medieval good guys, then I just started. That's it. I just made it international organization of medieval good guys, uh, and, uh, called two of my friends and said, you want to be in this? And they said, sure. Okay. Or I could be the only member of this organization. How would you know if the, inter the international organization of medieval good guys, I keep forgetting the name now. Uh, how would you know if it's a, a good or valid organization? You should be able to search around for other people talking about it. Don't just look at the name and go like, that sounds important to me, right? Look for other people talking about it. And you're probably not going to find people saying like, don't pay attention to them. They're a scam or they are, uh, you know, or, or they're just a fringe group. Instead, if they're not important, rather than hearing people discrediting it, you're just going to hear, you're just going to look around and find no one talked about it at all. And if no one's talking about this huge organization at all, it's probably not a very important organization and you should move on and find information from organizations that are because anything that people can be experts in, there will be organizations and professional groups, right? Everything from academic groups to, to every kind of professional group you can imagine. Any job that you have is going to have some kind of guild or union or just a, 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 a place that people will exchange information and that's where you want to go to find your information. So all of this is to get to the short version of this. And the short version is I know there's a lot of information out there on the, on websites. I know it's very easy just to take the first thing that you see. And when you're not an expert and you don't know where the first place to go is, you're almost always going to end up in the most mediocre, least valuable sites. So when you're looking for a website, you want to look at who the person is writing it or what the organization is producing it and whether those people or those organizations have good, valid, scholarly or professional credentials that you can be confident in. And if they don't, move on to somewhere else on the internet and find better sources.